Naboth by R Rudyard Kipling. This was how it happened, and the truth is also an allegory of empire. I met him at the corner of my garden, an empty basket on his head, and an unclean cloth around his loins. That was all the property to which Naboth had the shadow of a claim when I first saw him. He opened our acquaintance by begging. He was very thin and showed nearly as many ribs as his basket, and he told me a long story about fever and a lawsuit and an iron cauldron that had been seized by the court in execution of a decree. I put my hand into my pocket to help Naboth, as kings of the east have helped alien adventurers to the loss of their kingdoms. A rupee had hidden in my waistcoat lining. I knew, never knew it was there, and gave the trove to Naboth as a direct gift from heaven. He replied that I was the only legitimate protector of the poor he had ever known. Next morning he reappeared, a little fatter in the round, and curls himself into knots in the front veranda. He said I was his father and his mother, and the direct descendant of all the gods of his pantheon, besides controlling the destinies of the universe. He himself was but a sweetmeat seller, and much less important than the dirt under my feet. I had heard this sort of thing before, so I asked him what he wanted. My rupee, quoth Rimnaboth, had raised him to the everlasting heavens, and he wished, he wished to prefer a request. He wished to establish a sweetmeat pitch near the house of his benefactor to gaze on my reverend countenance as I went to and fro illuminating, illuminating the world. I was graciously pleased to give permission, and he went away with his head between his knees. Now at the far end of my garden the slopes towards the public the ground slopes towards the public road, and the slope is crowned with a thick shrubbery. There's a short carriage road from the house to the mall, which passes close to the shrubbery. Next afternoon that I saw that Naboth had seated himself at the bottom of the slope, down in the dust of the public road, and in the full glare of the sun, with a starved basket of greasy sweets in front of him. He had gone into trade once more on the strength of my munificent donation, and the ground was his paradise by my honored favor. Remember, there was only Naboth, his basket, the sunshine, the gray dust, when the sap of my empire first began. Next day he had moved himself up the slope nearer to my shrubbery, and waved a palm leaf fan to keep the flies off the sweets. So I judged that he must have done a fair trade. Four days later I noticed that he had backed himself and his basket under the shadow of the shrubbery, and had tied an Isabella-colored rag between two branches in order to make more shade. There were plenty of sweets in his basket. I thought that trade must certainly be looking up. Seven weeks later the government took up a plot of ground for a chief court close to the end of my compound, and employed near, nearly four hundred coolies on the foundation. Naboth brought a bought a blue and white striped bath blanket, a brass lampstand, and a small boy to cope with the rush of trade, which was tremendous. Five days later he brought a huge, fat, red-backed account book and a glass inkstand. Thus I saw that the coolies had been getting into his debt and that commerce was increasing on legitimate lines of credit. Also I saw that one basket had grown into three, and that Naboth had backed and hacked into the shrubbery and made himself a nice little clearing for the proper display of the basket, the blanket, the books, and the boy. One week and five days later he had built a mud fireplace in the clearing and the fat account book was overflowing. He said that God had created a few Englishmen of my kind and that I was the incarnation of all human virtues. He offered me some of his sweets as tribute and, by accepting these, I acknowledged him as my feudatory under the skirts of my protection. Three weeks later I noticed that the boy was in the habit of cooking Naboth's midday meal for him, and Naboth was beginning to grow a stomach. He had hacked away more of my shrubbery, and owned another and a fatter account book. Fatter account book. Eleven weeks later Naboth had eaten his way nearly through that shrubbery, and there was a reed hut with a bedstead outside it, standing in the little glade that he had eroded. Two dogs and a baby slept on the bedstead, so I fancied Naboth had taken a wife. He said that he had, by my favor, done this thing, and that I was several times finer than Krishna. Six weeks and two days later a mud wall had grown up in the back of the hut. There were fowls in front, and it smelled a little. 
The municipal secretary said that a cesspool was forming in the public road from the drainage of my compound and that I must take steps to clear it away. I spoke to Naboth. He said I was lord paramount of his earthly concerns and the garden was all my own property and sent me some more sweets in a second-hand duster. Two months later, a coolie bricklayer was killed in a scuffle that took place opposite Naboth's vineyard. The inspector of police said it was a serious case, went into my servant's corner, insulted my butler's wife, and wanted to arrest my butler. The curious thing about the murder was that most of the coolies were drunk at the time. Naboth pointed out that my name was a strong shield between him and his enemies, and he expected that another baby would be born to him shortly. Four months later, the, the hut was all mud walls, very solidly built, and Naboth had used most of my shrubbery for his five goats. A silver watch and an aluminum chain shone upon his very round stomach. My servants were alarmingly drunk several times, and used to waste the day with Naboth when, he got, when they got the chance. I spoke to Naboth. He said, by my favor and the glory of my countenance, he would make all his womenfolk ladies, and that if anyone hinted that he was running an illicit still under the shadow of the tamarisks, why I, his superior, his Sussurian, were it was to prosecute. A week later, he hired a man to make several dozen square yards of trellis work to put round the back of his hut, and that his womenfolk might be screened from the public gaze. The man went away in the evening and left his day's work to pave the shortcut from the public road to my house. I was driving home in the dusk and turned the corner by Naboth's vineyard quickly. The next thing I knew that was next thing I knew was that the horses of the Fantian were stamping and plunging in the strongest sort of bamboo network. Both beasts came down. One rose with nothing more than chipped knees. The other was so bad, badly kicked that I was forced to shoot him. Naboth is gone now, and his hut is ploughed into its native mud with sweetmeats instead of salt for a sign that the place is accursed. I've built a summer house to overlook the end of the garden, and it is as a fort on my frontier whence I guard my empire. I know exactly how Ahab felt. He has, has been shamefully misrepresented in the scriptures. That is uh, Naboth by Rudyard Kipling.